Now I'm going to read some verses to you this morning. I'm going to try and do something a little different today. I hope you're ready for different. Is that all right? All right. Parents room, ready for different? All right. Thumbs up from the parents in the parents room. That's good. Now the title of this morning's message is called Between Your Promise and His Power. Between Your Promise and His Power. Now, I'm trying to do some different things today. I'm trying to teach, which I'm not terribly good at. I'm not a teacher, but I'm going to try and do some teaching. I'm going to try and do some preaching, which I'm probably a little bit better at. And I want to also prophesy, speak something into your life about your future. So I want us this morning, which we've already done, I just get a sense that we are prepared for what God wants to speak to us this morning. I get a sense that even online, we're ready to receive what it is that God wants to bring into our spirit today. And even if you're listening back or watching back, I know this moment is for you. And as we open this text, and I have got a bit of Bible to read to you this morning, but as we open this text, I want it to not just be words on a page, but as I read this through to us, I want you to have an open heart to let these words do more than just be heard by you, but let these words minister to you. Because on this day, Pentecost Sunday, we really are emphasising the reality and the power of the Spirit of God at work in our lives today. And so as I read these words, don't just let them wash over you, let them speak to you. Are you ready? We're going to go to Exodus chapter 19, verse 16 to 20. I'm going to read some verses. I want you to either watch the screen or read along. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Here we go. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them from the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because of the Lord. He had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. I would have, I wouldn't be going up there. Moses climbed the mountain. It goes on to say Exodus 32. That's Exodus 19. Now Exodus 19, I'll unpack this later, what it means, why it's important for Pentecost Sunday. But if we go to Exodus chapter 32, this is obviously, uh, you know, uh, 13 chapters later, it says, When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain. Everybody say, how long? How long it was taking Moses to come back to mountain. They gathered around Aaron. He was Moses' 2IC. And they said, come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. Because they had lost their leader. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us from here to this land of Eat. Eat out from this land of Egypt. And so Aaron said, Take the gold rings from your ears, from your wives and your sons and daughters, and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, he melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. These are the gods, these gods. Gods that we've created with our own hands, these golden calves, which we know isn't the God that brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. In their impatience and distrust, what they did, they they substituted the God who set them free for a God of their own creation. Exodus 32 verse 19 to 21 goes on to say, When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing. This is as he was coming down the mountain and he burned with anger and he threw the stone tablets, the law that God had given him, the gift that was for the people of God. He threw them on the ground, smashing them on the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf they had made and he burned it and he ground it into powder and he threw it in the water and he forced the people to drink it. <laughs> you know, they were, they were suffering from the, uh, the, the, the failings of their own mistakes. And so he says, finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, he said, what did these people do to you to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? That's the Exodus account at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, I'll get to this later. I'm trying to teach something today, but I have to get these verses out first. And you have to just be putting them into your spirit because I'm going to call back to them later. So this is the story of Moses at Mount Sinai. And this is 50 days after the Israelites had first left 
captivity in Egypt and they find themselves here camped at the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses ascends to the mountain to bring them the gift of freedom that was promised to them, a way to live that would set them free called the Ten Commandments. And he brings them down the mountain and instead of being a time of joy and celebration and the release of power and freedom, it is a, it is a time of disappointment and discouragement for Moses and Aaron. Now, let's fast forward to Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. This is the account of the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 9 says this. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept on asking Him, Lord, has the time come? Everybody say, has the time come? Has the time come for you to keep for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. For you to free Israel and restore our kingdom. You know, we thought Israel was free because they left Egypt. But obviously they'd found themselves back in captivity some years later. And now the people of Israel once again are asking the prophet, is this a time where you're going to set us free? And Jesus says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times and they are not for you to know. But, so in other words, you will not necessarily know the time, but, but, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud. He was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. He was taken up into a cloud. And then Acts chapter 2, fast forward to the day of Pentecost. All the believers were meeting together in one place, suddenly. Everybody say, suddenly. Suddenly. There was a sound from heaven, like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Windstorm, sound, loud, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and and settled down from, from heaven on them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. What a powerful moment. A deep sense of awe, Acts chapter 2 verse 43, some verses later, a deep sense of awe came over all of them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. So Lord, as we begin to unpack these texts, I pray this morning that you would hide me behind your word and you would be seen loud and clear that your message would go forward this morning in such a way that it wouldn't just be information, but it would be transformation. I pray, Lord God, that on this day, as we commemorate the power of the Holy Spirit being released to inaugurate the church, that we will rise up to be the church that you've called us to be. Lord God, help us to see your word clearly. Help us to be empowered by what it says to us. And God, I pray we'd have open hearts to receive the information filling and the empowerment of the Spirit of God today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Kimmy. And thanks, Tom. Well done, Tom. Big round of applause for Tom. Good work. (laughs) Now, I love the the, the story of Acts uh, chapter 1 and 2, where, where Luke, the author of Acts, he begins to unpack this powerful day where Jesus says the Spirit's going to come upon the, upon you and we're going to inaugurate the church. And you're going to go into all the word, world and share this gospel story. And I love what Luke does because Luke here, he, he skillfully overlays the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, with what is in fact the very first Pentecost. Because Pente means five and Pentecost is, is 50 days from when Israel was set free from Egypt until the journey to Mount Sinai, 50 days. And so this is a celebration that we, Luke talks about, which is 50 days from Jesus' death. It's, it's a scheduled feast. It's the Feast of Pentecost. It was coming. In fact, most of those moments in Jesus' life where he uh, has marker moments that are important to the story of uh, salvation and the gospel happen on the traditional Jewish calendar, Jewish feasts. And this is one of them. So Jesus here is telling the people, the church, the disciples, he's saying on this day, oh, actually, well, he doesn't actually tell them on this day. What he says, he says, go to, the, go to Jerusalem and wait for me and wait for me. And what Luke says, he says on this day, and he overlays the story of the day of Pentecost with the first experience at Mount Sinai, which we've just read, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And the Exodus account that we read 50 days after the Israelites were set free from Egypt, We arrive here at this commemorative celebration in the Jewish calendar, which is actually called 
the Feast of Weeks, which is actually seven weeks of feasting, seven, seven to 49. And the day of Pentecost is the day after the seven weeks of feasting. And so this is on that day. And that's why in the Bible it says when the day of Pentecost had fully come. And so the Jewish people also call that Shavuot or Pentecost. And it's 50 days in this story that Luke tells after the crucifixion. And so what Luke has done here is that he is showing us that the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, it doesn't just fulfill something that Jesus said to the disciples then, it actually fulfills all of the promises that were promised from Mount Sinai until the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a promise that there is power to live in freedom for everyone, from Mount Sinai to Pentecost and then to today, for everyone to possess the promised land, to flourish and thrive and live forever beginning today. That's what the promise of Pentecost is all about. It's why Luke shows us that it's not just about the day of Pentecost on the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, but it points back to the giving of the gift of the promise of freedom the Israelites received at the base of Mount Sinai. It fulfills all the promises. It's a complete fulfillment of your life to be in power, to be flourishing, to thriving, to live forever, to have salvation. And in fact, what Luke's showing is that it's impossible for us as Christians to live lives without the power of the Spirit to fulfill the promises that God has put on our life. He's trying to make it as clear as possible. And, he, and what I want to do today is that I want you to sort of step into an experience of fulfilment in your own life of receiving all the promises God has for you. I don't want you to walk away from here without the infilling and the empowerment of the Spirit of God to release in your life what Luke is trying to show us is available to every person that believes and calls upon the name of Jesus. So after our service today and, and toward the end of the service, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a moment if you would like to receive prayer for the power of the God and the power of the Holy Spirit to be imparted into your life, for you to live the kind of life that Luke points all Christians toward to live. But what I want to do, I want to look at these similarities in this text and see what Luke is trying to teach us today, not just teach the first church, but you and me. We are the church, the same church that was inaugurated on the day of Pentecost. And so Luke, as much as he's teaching the first century church, he's teaching the 21st century church today. And the first thing that we see, the first similarity in this text that we have to be aware of and have to apply to our lives and to our church is that unity is what releases power. Unity is what releases power in the church. Unity, unity. In Exodus 19 verse 2, I read to you, when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Now when you read this, you probably should ask the question, why does the author tell us that the Israelites camped twice? I mean, I would have saved the parchment and the ink and just said, and camped in the wilderness in the front of Mount Sinai. But for some reason, there's two words that say the same thing in the same sentence. And when I went to school, you weren't allowed to do that. <laughs> and scholars have argued as to why there are two uses of this word camped here in this, first, uh, in this text. And what they say is the first, well, what we know is the first use of the word camped is actually a plural. And so it is a word, a Jewish word, which is, well, the word camp in, in Hebrew is shana, C-H-A-N-A, camp. The plural of shana is yakanu, camps. You know how plurals work? There's one and then there's many of. <laughs> you keeping up? Camps. The second use is the word yishan, which is singular, one camp. And so Rashi, who was a famous medieval French Jewish commentator on the Torah and the Talmud, pointed out that in all other uses of Shana, the word camp, the plural Yakanu is used, they camped, in all other instances. And that's because the Jews, he would argue, were in dissent and disagreement. But when they encamped to receive the laws of God, they used a singular, Yikan, to show they were all of one heart, 
and one mind. Does this sound familiar? Acts chapter 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, when all the believers were meeting together in one place. Unity releases the power of the Spirit of God on the church. When we meet together in one place. Not just together, plural, wherever we kind of find ourselves on Sunday. But we're together in one place. So I want to encourage you that you should expect to see the release of the power of God on your life today because you have made a decision not just to be the church, plural, but to be the church together in one place. And if you're not in one place, there's always next week. Don't tell me that you're not seeing the power of God move in your life and you want to see more of God released in your family, in your marriage, if you never find yourself together in one place in church. Now that's hard, but it's true. Because there's a difference between being camps and being camped together in one place. In fact, some versions say in Acts chapter 2, they were all together in one accord. Of one mind. That's a powerful similarity that Luke draws for us. Here's the second one. When God moves, everything moves. When God moves, everything moves. I love this because I love how Luke points back to the experience at the mountain. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 16, He says this, he says, Thunder and lightning and thick smoke and a loud trumpet blast so that all the people trembled. It would happen at the mountain. Remember how I said I wouldn't like to go up the mountain when this was happening? Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. You'd hate to have, like, this is kind of like a, this is a, an event of you know, historic proportion, something you'd see on the big screen in a the movie theatre with rumbling subwoofers, lightning and thunder and thick smoke and, and a loud trumpet blast. And, and Luke, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, he says this, he says, Suddenly there was a sound like a rushing wind and fire from heaven. There was a sound like a rushing wind and, and fire fell from heaven. I mean, what he's saying is that there's something unmistakable about the release of the power of God on the church. And so it's okay for the church to look a little noisy. It's okay for the church to sound a little loud. It's okay for the church to burn with passion and Holy Spirit fire because it's the demonstration and the reality of a church that is moved by the Spirit of God because when God moves, everything moves. Oh, Moses, you know, he just came to the base of the mountain and he, you know, God just sent a dove and the dove came along and landed on his arm and, you know, whispered some sweet words into his ear and Moses goes, all right, guys, uh, I'm just going to let you know what God's saying to you and come gather around, take a seat and... I mean, there's a reason why it wasn't like that. There's a reason why this moment was pivotal, pivotal, pivotal in the story of the nation of Israel. Because when God wants to reshape and reform and re-identify something, He has to move something. And in you this morning, maybe God needs to reshape, re-identify and, and, and rename you. He needs to re-identify you. And maybe that's going to be uncomfortable. Maybe it's going to cause a little shift in who you are. It's maybe going to cause a little, little tear in the seam. Maybe it's going to be a little noisy, a little loud. Maybe it's going to burn like fire within your body. But when God moves, everything moves. I mean, it either matters or it doesn't. It's either true or it's not. We're not just here playing games. We're here because the world matters to Jesus. And you've been called to to go into all the world and share the gospel message, the transformation that he's had in your life. It's not just playing games. It matters. And so when God moves, everything moves. That's what Luke's showing us anyway in Acts chapter 2. He also shows us this. He says that, uh, again, he, he, he so cleverly overlays these two stories when he points to the ascension of Moses up the mountain and the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And what he's saying is that ascension, the, these moments where, where Moses climbs the mountain to hear from God and Jesus returns to the Father, he, he's showing us that these aren't goodbyes. They're actually a get ready. They're a get ready. And, and we miss this sometimes. Because, you know, human nature, when someone moves away from us, we think it's a goodbye, it's a farewell, it's a, it's a, it's a moment of uh, reduction, it's a moment of loss. 
But what Luke's showing us is that when Moses left and when Jesus left, they weren't saying goodbye. They were saying, get ready. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, it says this, Luke, he says, After saying this, this is uh, Jesus, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. Exodus 19, verse 20, The Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Jesus is ascended, ascending to heaven. Moses climbing to God. And when it looks and feels like God is far away, He's really asking you to get ready. Do you feel like God is distant from you today? That is His invitation to you, to get ready. Because something's coming your way. Are you ready? Even though it feels like God's far away. Come on, let's change that into the invitation that it is to get ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Are you getting ready? Or are you pining for the prophet? Oh, I wish you were only like you used to be. I wish you were only here with me right now. The people of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai. Oh God, Moses, where have you gone? Oh, we need you. We want you. Where have you gone? Impatient. And between your promise, which is what this message is called this morning, and his power at work in your life, there was this other, there was this other, uh, there was this other similarity that Luke was showing us in this text. And, and it's this moment of waiting. It's this moment of waiting where the, is, where the Israelites are at the base of Mount Sinai and they're waiting for Moses. And, and where the disciples are in the upper room and they're, they're waiting for the promise. Between the promise and the power of God, there's a season of waiting. And it's, it's here for a purpose. It's here to show us that, that the release of power upon our life isn't, isn't just about being united. It isn't just about expecting miraculous signs. It's also about doing the work to wait for God's timing. And, and I love this. Oh, let me tell you this story first. I used to, one of my first jobs that I had was, I think I've told you this story before. I used to mow lawns, uh, whippersnip, you know, grass. I used to, and I enjoyed the job. It was fun. It was hard work. And my boss was a bit of a slave driver. And so we would, we would get up early before the sun, like a long time before the sun rose, like hours, because he had headlights on his mower. And so he would pick me up in the middle of, well, it wasn't the middle of the night, but it felt like it was the middle of the night. And we would drive to the, you know, we'd do some work out in the vineyards out here, huge big amphitheatres and big paddocks and, you know, river, uh, river embankments. And it was, you know, thousands of, you know, acres of property we'd have to look after. And we'd get up really early and he would put the lights on and he'd get going, brrr, he'd be buzzing around, he'd be mowing along. He'd say to me, Look, there's no point you getting up and doing anything out of the truck because you can't see what you're doing and you don't have any light. So just wait in the truck. And when the sun comes up, that's when you get up, you come out, you can help me and we can get up. Now, okay, I get that. But there were long days and the sooner I got my work done, the sooner we got home. So yeah, he gets a head start, but I'm waiting in the truck for the sun. So what I used to do sometimes when I was getting more familiar with the places we were going, I would just start early. I'd get out while it was still dark. I kind of knew where the trees were. I'd whistle around the trees and do the edges and, you know, I'd sort of just get a bit of a head start on the day so that by the end of the day, we'd be able to finish early and leave and be home on time. Uh, however, <laughs> the times that I did that, when I, took the, when I took matters into my own hands and started early, almost always, once the sun came up and I could see where I'd been, <laughs> so wow that wasn't how I imagined it looking in my head in the dark <laughs> so not only when I took matters into my own hands did I make a mess I also had to do it again and it also took longer when I took matters into my own hands not only did I make a mess I had to do it again and it took longer. And I know that is God's word for us today. What will we do in our waiting? When we don't wait well, when we don't wait well, and we take, when we take matters into our own hands, this is what happens. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. 
when the people saw how long it was taking. How long? They gathered Aaron, they gathered Aaron and said, Hey mate, this is taking too long. We need to worship and we need to do it today. Let's make some gods who can lead us. And they did. And the result of that story, Exodus 32 verse 28, which I don't have on the screen, 3,000 people suffered because of that decision. 3,000 people died under the judgment of God because of that decision. But when we trust God for His suddenly, when we just wait for God's timing, when we trust God for His suddenly, when we're united in, together in one accord, in, in one place, when we're ready to have God just disrupt the natural order of things for our benefit, when, we, when we're really willing to wait for as long as it takes, when we're willing to trust God for His suddenly, not get out too early and start attending to things in our own strength, our own power, our own might, with our own plans and our own agenda, when we're willing to wait on the empowerment of the Spirit of God, Luke shows us what can happen. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, 3,000 people came to Jesus on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people fell under the judgment of God because they just couldn't wait for the promise. But Luke reverses the story and he shows us that if we're willing to wait for the power of God to be released in our church, on our lives, we can see our world transformed and thousands of people come to faith. It, it, re, it redeems the mistakes of the past. It restores the error that's been before. And for you in your life, wherever you've, mis, wherever you've messed up and stuffed up and not waited and gone ahead and not trusted God and trusted yourself, whatever mistakes you've made in the past, simply waiting on God for His divine appointed timing can redeem all of that, can restore all of that and can make it new again when we wait for His suddenly. A deep sense of awe, Acts chapter 2, verse 43, came over all of them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together, here it is again, in one place and shared everything they had. So what do I want to do? I want to pray for you right now. If you're stirred this morning by the opportunity to be once again just empowered by the Spirit of God, uh, if you're waiting on God for something in your life and you need that suddenly moment for yourself. I just want you to stand where you are. Be bold, be brave. Make a declaration by standing to your feet and say, yes, that's me. I want to receive prayer right now, this day, for, for the, the suddenly moment that I know is coming my way. I, I want to, I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm united together. I'm not just camped off on my own where I'm camped together in one place. Come on, where there's unity, God releases a blessing. Not only that, but I'm ready to have my life changed. I'm ready for anything to happen because when God moves, everything moves. It's worth it to stand up and declare that I'm going to receive all that God has for me today. Come on, don't be too shy to, to, to miss out on what God wants to do in your life. And it's not just for your sake, but it's for the redemption of your family and, and all the things in the past that maybe have not gone according to your plan. This is a moment for you to receive all that God has for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We might just sing the lyrics to that song while I pray, just so that it just, it just reasserts that we're making room for the Spirit of God. Just like the disciples on that uh, day, they made room for the Spirit of God. They made room. They, they were there waiting in prayer, believing God for the miraculous. And I, I, I want that to be your story today. As you stand and wait and believe God in prayer for the miraculous, the Spirit of God will fall upon your life today and you'll burn with fire. It's okay for things to get noisy and things to go a little sideways because when God moves, everything moves. So come on, this is where we're together expecting blessing from God. I pray you'd begin to, like the disciples, anticipate something to move and shift in your life. If you haven't stood to your feet yet and you want to, don't miss out. Stand up now and say, yes, I'm believing that the Spirit of God will fall upon my life today and will change something about my life and my past and my future, that this can be a pivotal moment in the history of my family, a pivotal moment in the history of my life. My story can change today by the power of the Spirit of God. 
Heavenly Father, for every person standing in this room, I pray that this Pentecost Sunday would be a day that changes for everybody. Lord God, I pray that as those made, as people have made those bold decisions to stand for you, I pray, Lord God, right now that you'd be just uh, you'd be turning up in their life. Those open hearts, I pray you'd be filling with the Spirit of God right now. Yes, Lord God, just do whatever you want to do in our life right now. Do whatever you want to do. We just trust you with it. We trust you with our lives. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for all you're doing. Maybe you're in the room this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus before. This is somewhat unfamiliar to you. Well, you're in the right place at the right time because I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus for the first time right now. If you feel a stirring in, the, in your heart, maybe you're, maybe you're standing, maybe you're not, maybe you're seated, maybe you're online. If you're feeling a stirring in your heart to respond to an invitation to know Jesus this morning, I want to invite you to, to make that a reality. I'm not going to let that moment pass you by. And all I want you to do is just, just so I can see it, just raise your hand. Say, yeah, that's me, Luke. I want to make that decision today for the first time, if that's you. Online, if that's you, yes. If there's anybody else, if there's anybody else, we've got time for you. And church, we're going to pray this prayer together. And as we do, yes, it's for those of us maybe who are saying yes to Jesus for the first time, but it's for those of us who have known Jesus for a long time. We're going to rededicate our lives to Jesus this Pentecost Sunday. So remember, it either matters or it doesn't. So come on, as we pray this prayer, let's pray it with all of our heart and believe that this is a moment of transformation as we rededicate our lives to Jesus today. So come on, church, why don't you pray after me? Jesus, this is my decision. Today, I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my Saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, church.